back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Bell, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in a fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm super excited to welcome onto our series. Finally, I'm so excited to have her, the amazing Dr. Lisa Palmer Olson. She is a certified EFT trainer, supervisor, therapist. She's one of the original founders for the San Diego Center for Emotionally Focused Therapy. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist. And together with fellow EFT trainer, Catherine DeBrun, they have a nonprofit organization called Renova where they work with high conflict divorce cases, um, a lot of betrayals, and they're also very passionate about training therapists in these kinds of dynamics using EFT and attachment. So I'm just super blessed to have her. And it's perfect because our topic today is going to be on dun -da -da, betrayal trauma. <laughs> so welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's All right. Opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. So you have this amazing corporation where you specialize in high conflict divorce and you see a lot of betrayals. You witness kind of a lot of things that happen between couples. And so as, as folks are thinking about betrayal trauma, maybe can we just start off and kind of give them like a, maybe a definition of what we mean when we say betrayal trauma? Sure. I, I like to think of betrayal trauma as a betrayal of trust that's happened in a relationship where it's almost impossible to recover or feels like to let that go would be setting aside a part of yourself that is feeling completely unsafe and un unseen. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you think about attachment injury, a la EFT, right? in the old days, we used to think of attachment injury as like a one-time event at a mm -hmm. great moment of need where a partner was not there or betrayed their partner on some level, abandoned them on some level. And you see that showing up in their process as you're sitting with them as the clinician, you see that there's something that's kind of anchoring them and preventing them from trusting their partner. And it mm -hmm. seems like they go back or they're bringing up this one moment. That's what we used to think attachment injury well, that's how we were trained initially by Sue Johnson, what an attachment injury is. As we grew through that next 10 years, I think we started seeing like, wow, emotional abuse can also be something that's considered a relationship betrayal or an attachment injury, like recycled trauma emotionally happening between a couple can make or kind of support a process that's very rigid and blocks people from being able to connect in vulnerable ways and trust each other. So we started looking at relationship betrayals as it can cover a lot of different things, like a one-time event, not mm -hmm. showing up, let's say at a wedding emotionally mm -hmm. for your partner, um, or like dancing with an ex at your wedding. I know that's a big one that comes up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, right? If that becomes in and of itself an event that has been recycled, but the issue is not that actual event. It's how they process that event together. And that leads to a very rigid style between the two couple, between the two partners that blocks them from being able to process through and past that event. So relationship betrayals can cover the whole gamut. It can be porn addiction. It can be a disclosure of an affair. It can be a financial betrayal. It's how those events are handled within the relationship that causes a block from the couple. And then it causes a trauma, a loss of trust, right? And then how do we work with that within the EFT model? So what I think I hear you saying is, you know, betrayals can happen in a variety of ways. And may affect the the bond and the trust in a variety of intensities right some mm -hmm. events you know might not have been as large you know just like anything in the world's kind of like a spectrum right you know some may be right. smaller but they yeah. still kind of like stuck on the inside and and i remember when when i was trained in at the beginning of EFT, how it was like when you notice your client is stuck on an event and they keep going back to something mm -hmm. They want to keep, that's just a sign that there's an injury there that needs to be dealt with. Right. And, you know, the event themselves 
can break in trust, but also what may compound the situation, make it worse is the way that it's handled after. Right. Um, and some, some folks do genuinely try, but again, may struggle to get to that depth and they, they may feel through the process in a clumsy way that inadvertently creates more traumas <laughs> in the process, right? Because like, here I was in this moment of vulnerability, and I'm reaching to you to say, to let me know that this matters, and right. that you actually can, in in some kind of an embodied way, get it and the impact right. that it's had, but also to address that in a very specific way. And they may, you know, the other partner may say something or handle it in a way very imperfectly that sends the opposite message. Right. And then it's like, oh, here I am already in this vulnerable place. And now I feel like I'm getting abandoned or blamed or, you know, so right. yeah, yeah, I call them like compound fractures. <laughs> right. And I think the original, the original discovery, or I guess the conceptual idea of attachment injuries can block mm -hmm. stage two work, right? Mm -hmm. They, Sue Johnson discovered attachment injuries because we were seeing that one of the partners would mm -hmm. not take the risks mm -hmm. in the session and would tend to draw back to there's been some betrayal of trust or an event that makes it unsafe mm -hmm. to share at a vulnerable level and to ask for what you need. So the clinician would get stuck and trapped, like moving between change process and stage two. Mm -hmm. And then they would discover there's this thing that happened, right? That that they can't let go of. And for a long time, we thought, oh, we got to process that thing. And we have these steps that you got to process this event, but it's actually not the event itself that causes the stuck spots, right? It's how the couple, like you're saying, how mm -hmm. the couple is managing, whether or not they could talk about it at the depths, which they need to talk about it in order to move through and past it. And so mm -hmm. you're participating and kind of dissecting their pattern and mm -hmm. seeing there's these rigid spots right? Mm -hmm. They're blocks that people can't get past because they've been so injured from a yeah. perspective. So I love what the event, the event itself, it's whether or not they could talk yeah. about it. If it was isolated, they could yeah. talk to their partner and talk about how it felt in the moment. Yes. And like the degree and, and, you know, again, there's, there's just so many layers to an event or an injury that can affect the intensity in which it affects the bond and mm -hmm. the trust and such. And, you know, like if it was a small, a smaller incident, but again, the couple still struggled and, and one person is still stuck versus like, you know, even if there was an affair, you know, and it just sometimes there are events, events that are catastrophic, you know, it feels like a big wrecking ball just right. came to smash that foundation. But again, when the couple tries to talk about it, again, it's that process. And on that continuum of the layers. So you mentioned like the steps, you know, so we have like a sub model within our model around attachment injury repair. We call it the attachment injury repair method, attachment injury repair model, whatever. And traditionally, we used to teach it as doing that in stage two. Um, I think we've sort of become a little more flexible with that sort of depending, like we really just attune and, and, trying to figure out if the couple is ready to go there and can handle it and we can repair it on the level it needs to actually heal, then we'll go for it. I think wherever we are in the process, but um, yeah. certainly well, it's like, if we can't do the deeper work, we're going to have to scaffold it, but we still right. work with it in stage one. Right. And I think the part you were just reflecting about is where we come in, uh, Dr. Jim Furrow and myself and kind of made sense of where do we, place this mm -hmm. attachment injury work. And yes, in the beginning, we were all taught you move attachment injuries into stage two, right? But really that's not the right languaging. What it is, is that you, the depth of the repair happens in stage two. There's a lot that needs to happen in stage one before you can get to the depth of the repair, right? But the way that was translated initially um, in the beginning of EFT kind of coming into USA was that you would hold that injury and not address it until stage two. Mm -hmm. And that's just not attuned, as you said, right? It's not attuned. And also the attachment injury resolution kind of research article, the, the process or the steps that are outlined, there's really a process, right? That they saw clinicians doing as they entered into 
a conversation around these injuries that couples would have. It's like how they were tracking the repair process that would happen when couples could repair from an attachment attachment injury event. It's really looking at enactments and what is that what does that look like when it's themed towards an attachment injury in mm-hmm. the moment that's coming up, whether it was five years ago or five minutes ago, right? Yeah. So one of the things that Jim and I have done over the last, I'd say 10 years is Basically, when I was a doctoral student, I'm like, okay, I'm reading these attachment injury steps and this doesn't help me when somebody comes in and just found out about an affair, Mm -hmm. right? Because if I go with what I've been trained to do, I would say, hold on. I understand you just found this out. I'd really like to understand your pattern, right? Looking at step one, I need to align with you. Well, step one is about alliance, right? Step Mm -hmm. one is about attuning, listening to your client's experience, Mm -hmm. right? But if they're coming in and there's a massive bleed out in the room and you're like, excuse me, can you talk to me about your pattern? What are your behaviors? What are your triggers? How do you respond? Mm -hmm. It was so misattuned how we were all handling it initially or trained to handle it. Mm -hmm. And so coming from a place of attunement and alliance and understanding how betrayals and relationships impact the pattern, you have to have some sort of map with that in step two of EFT. Now, the repair process is outlined in that attachment injury article, and you can follow that once you get stabilization and your assessment is completely, you know, fully complete and you understand the nature of the betrayals, but you can't move into that process in stage one because you'll just blow everybody up. Mm-hmm. Right. Nobody's ready. They don't have the scaffolding to hold that. So it feels like what Jim and I spent time on is stage one, really high conflict attachment injury, relationship betrayals. People are coming in the door with bullets flying, mm-hmm. right? At disclosure or discovery of whatever the betrayal is. And how do you organize that? What do you know? Right. What does EFT look like when somebody's coming in and they just found out about multiple relationships that somebody's had in the porn industry, let's say, for example, they just found out their partner's been with 13 prostitutes, right? Mm-hmm. What do you, how does EFT work with that? Right. And my cases were at that level and I needed to dissect that and make sense of it because I needed a map. So that's where we pulled away from kind of looking at this as a model over here. It's more of a process mm-hmm. that we were coding and looking at the attachment injury process repair like that's helpful to look at when you get there, but it's not something you can apply right. in stage one work with somebody right. who's coming in who feels like they've been extremely betrayed. Yeah. Right. I just took a bullet. I'm bleeding. Uh, you know, nobody's, nobody cares about my arm or my finger or the paperwork, like right. just fix the bleed out and see the bullet right. and fix the bleed. Right. You know? right. And that's something that I think in the past we would have said, Um, We see that you're hurting. We need to understand your relationship history, your attachment history, where the betrayal happened. We're asking all about that, but not moving emotionally and stabilizing the process in the moment. Most people don't come in saying, I'm committed to this person. I'm coming into therapy. They come in to consider, Mm -hmm. in my my world, they come in to consider whether or not they're willing to put their heart back on the table. Yeah, There's a lot of EFT in the beginning there to see if you can lay the groundwork and the foundation for the repair process to happen. And so we really have outlined that and made it very clear and have given clinicians a map. Mm -hmm. So it's embedded within that is how to deal with high conflict, right? Mm -hmm. High conflict cases, bullets are flying everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's why we- High escalation, right? High escalation, right? High escalation. Because it can be high, you can be a highly escalated couple and be silent and hostile. Right, mm-hmm. or you can be a highly escalated couple and be loud and attacking. Both partners are attacking, or one shut down. Right, so they're just flip sides of the same coin. And what the therapist does in that moment, we wanted to come in and resource these clinicians because people are like, we don't understand. We're trying to do the attachment injury steps. Somebody came in with a, an affair they just found out, and they're moving in that way, following those steps, and it's just not something you can do in stage one. It doesn't right. make sense. Right. So. so- few things. I I love what you're saying. So, and I just, for those who are 
you know, because you're referencing. So Lisa and one of our other EFT trainers, Jim Furrow, have a training on um, repairing broken bonds and betrayals. So when she talks about her and Jim, they they have that training there, which is really awesome. So I should look it up and take it. And, you know, also, you know, again, that model, those steps we're talking about, the attachment injury resolution or repair model method kind of change names a little slightly over time. And really, I mean, even if we break that down in, in a nutshell, it's it's almost like it's still EFT within EFT, but it's almost like focusing on the injury as like a form of content in a way. And we're doing like enactments, like we're getting the attachment, meaning helping both people sit in the pain, you know, sharing, being able to open up and share the pain on the level that it exists and the meaning, have the other partner Hold that, you know, we're, we're still doing EFT, we're still doing a tango and an enactment. And it is like where we specifically with intention go into the injury, open it up, all the pain, and talk about it in that way, in a way that's going to be effective. And, you know, but again, I love what you're saying is we can't just like brush it aside when they come in, because, you know, a lot of times that's why they come in. And that's all they want to do. Well, at least... In a lot of cases, that's all at least one partner <laughs> wants to do is right. talk about, they need to talk about it. And so being able to put that into the process from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it's, I love how you say the scaffolding, like we're talking about it and addressing it from the beginning. We, we may not necessarily be opening it up mm -hmm. on, in the level, on the level that we would in stage two, right. but we're still addressing it. And you know, what's interesting too is sometimes the way that they're trying to handle it in at the beginning can resemble the cycle that led them, that brewed the perfect storm for this to happen. Right. Sometimes right. it's also different, like it changes the cycle. So we're sort of, it's we are true. assessing. Yeah, it can't, it, that's true. And I think initially you probably remember that we would train this as there would be two cycles, right? But what we saw over time is it's more of an advancement of an already previously set rigid mm -hmm. pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And it's how they're, how they're managing that betrayal looks very similar to how they manage vulnerability, emotional connection prior to the betrayal mm -hmm. and it's advanced, but what might look different on the outside is maybe you see someone who previously was more pursuing for vulnerability right, is now more shut down and cold if they've been injured or betrayed in that way. You may see someone who has, you know, previously strategized around avoidant kind of moves in the relationship around emotion that might be like coming forward, looking like a pursuer, right? Mm -hmm. But that's if you're tracking behaviors only, right? And the way we're looking at cycles and rigid positions in couple dynamics is we're looking at kind of who's moving towards vulnerability, not just behaviorally, but emotionally in the room. What do they do when vulnerability shows up, right? Do they trim it down and try to squash it? Or are they trying to expand? You know, are they hyper-regulating? Are they under-regulating? We're watching that. And the survival mechanisms that we employ have a lot to do with what has worked in the past and also whether or not your partner's responding, right? So we look mm -hmm. for the original pattern and how it's been impacted by the present betrayal or betrayals, plural. Yeah. So it's like, an advancement. Yeah. I love how you worded that and how you really like kind of tease apart that idea about tracking the behaviors only, you know, because you may have like that person that a withdrawer, maybe the other partner had the, an affair and now they went from kind of shut down sexually to like hyper pursuing, mm -hmm. you know, sexually, but again, they're not really, they're not addressing the things that block them from having that sexual connection before, or right. the feelings attached. They're just kind of like pleasing, placating, which could have been very much present before, just maybe not in that behavioral form. So we don't want to get right. stuck there. And you know, and, and pardon guys, my ADHD brain, sometimes I get off, like I have a couple points I want to make and I get halfway there and then I like okay. chase a squirrel somewhere. So <laughs> okay. I want to come back to that scaffolding. So we're st still holding that frame for, we are still address directly addressing. And again, 
I don't know where this myth came from that EFT does not confront things, but we are actually a very confrontive model. It's just in an empathic way, but we don't skirt issues. We go right for the hot potato, (laughs) right? But also, and while we're talking about it in stage one, it's going to be different than when we get to the level where we want to heal it. Because again, we need to make sure that both partners can talk about this in the level, on the level that can provide the most healing that's right. lasting over time. Couples might have come in and said, oh, but we tried to talk about this. And, or you might just be doing regular EFT. Maybe they don't present for an attachment injury, but you find out there's attachment right. injuries in the process. And they keep saying, I don't understand why my partner keeps bringing this up. We talked about, we talked about it. Right. And again, they get stuck there because they couldn't talk about it on that level. So can, you know, the one partner, you know, hold that frame talking about the pain in a non-blaming kind of way. Can the other partner hold that pain without shutting down, withdrawing, going to pleasing, placating? Can we both bring our vulnerability to the table and have an honest conversation that allows for that healing at stage two? It's why we got to get our scaffolding or I say our our sea legs. We got to get our sea legs out underneath us. Well, And I think some of what happens when, we moved into the season of we deal with attachment injuries in stage one was you had people moving in and what I would say doing like a reckless tango Mm -hmm. on an injury, right. That's been there and deepening it at such a level that the couple wasn't able to hold the space for that conversation. Mm -hmm. Like just reflecting on what you said about the pain, like holding Mm -hmm. the pain, there has to be safety and stabilization. We are very direct in working with high as highly escalated, especially when there's been relationship betrayals, they almost go hand in hand, right? There's escalation that is hard to manage and there has to be courtyarding. There has to be a way to, people have to trust the process. They have to trust that you're going to keep the process safe. But what we would see in the second season is people would go straight to the person who's been injured and heighten and deepen and ask them to turn towards their partner and express the level of pain that they had as a result of this betrayal. And their partner was like checked out or not able to at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. So they could be stuck in shame or defense. Right. And so the, it doesn't become a corrective emotional experience. experience. It becomes something that is more damaging at times because EFTers go for vulnerability. They have to have stability and you right. have to have safety in the process before you do that. So yeah, what- I say we like our work, we work up to vulnerability, but you know, I, I've heard somebody said, you know, there's a post recently and somebody thought, oh, we have to be able to do safe EFT. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means because we kind of assume that when a couple comes in, they don't have emotional safety. That's part of why they're there. Cause if they had it, they could, usually repair and solve these things themselves. So, you know, we do want to go for vulnerability, but we also hold space to the fact that they don't know how to create safety for both of them to engage in that vulnerability. And we work up like that's the money shot we're going towards. But so much of EFT is also working up to that where we can have that safe vulnerability. And that also brings me to an important point. Um, So while we are talking about betrayals, there can be a couple things that sort of stick up for therapists, like, you know, what if one partner is still engaging in an affair? Does that mean we can't do therapy? Or, you know, there's also like staggered disclosures, things that may continually to affect or can potentially be injurious while the therapy process is still happening. So can you speak to some of those ideas and around like contraindications, how you take things differently yeah. a little bit. I think we, one thing that's important is I've really worked on like speaking in, you know, on the continuum, as you said earlier, in that <clears throat> when you're talking about safe, unsafe, or withdraw or pursuer, or the injurer, the person who's been injured, right? I really like to think between, I guess, in the gray areas, but yet we also want it to be a process to be safe, right? So a process to explore where the wounds are, where the pain is. And part of that is the truth needs to get on the table, right? So if you're looking, I mean, staggered disclosures, that's the most injurious process that I think EFT people have, you know, facilitated 
by trying a la kind of the attachment injury model, right? They're trying to facilitate an emotional process, but don't have the scaffolding yet. Right. And so people are looking for this marker, like, oh, when it's safe enough, I'll tell it all. But we know that that's like Esther Perel, right? Death by a million cuts, right? As you make the process more safe, if they're sharing more and more, then how do you know where the marker is that everything's out on the table, right? You're always expecting something more to show up. So you have to be able to, as the clinician, run a process that's predictable and stable. And it starts with the truth. And it starts with being direct about what has happened and the consequences of staggering disclosures. We, Jim and I worked very closely with Stephanie Carnes um, in the CSAT um, training process. And Stephanie went through core skills and externship with me. And she has this masterful disclosure process, right? That EFTers we felt like needed to learn because there are safety check boxes everywhere in terms of setup and predictable sequences that can help with disclosures if not everything's on the table. Um, but then she said to me, like, we can do that part really well, but we don't know how to facilitate the corrective stage two process that you're talking about. If we blend these together, this could be really fantastic. So we did that in Arizona and we talked about how do you set up a process with a couple that's coming in and there's more to disclose. Right. And and making sure the support and resources are in place to handle that process and to know that you need to set that process up. I don't think EFT people have enough training in how to handle and manage disclosures, disclosures and go, go to the truth and the need for stability and scaffolding in the beginning before we move to vulnerability. Vulnerability comes with a trust in the process, not necessarily a trust in your partner, especially right. if there's been relationship betrayals. So we are moving in that kind of space to get everything on the table. So we know what we're dealing with and then yeah. we're facilitating some of the vulnerable pieces mm -hmm. around like what the impact was of this betrayal. Now that it's on the table, now we can start to talk about the impact of the betrayal for both partners. Yeah. So two things, and you said something really wonderful. And I just want to highlight that was about, you know, in the beginning, we are not asking our clients to trust each other. That would be a grave misattunement because they're not in a place where they can. We're just, we're asking them to trust us and for us as a therapist to trust the process. And um, the other part is that even if there is a partner who might still be engaged in you know, a betrayal process, whether they're just, you know, lying and maybe the the damaging part is just lying about anything. Like maybe they're not having an affair. They just have a hard time telling the truth about anything in the relationship and they're still doing that. Or if they are still engaged in a um, an affair or something, again, in EFT, we don't see these as um, contraindications for doing therapy. Like we can't, like, what is that? We can't <laughs> Yeah, get it's, therapy to be ready for therapy. Like, we, let's just it's train. Ready. Yeah, yeah. No, let's train and therapy. and learn how to do therapy. And right. it's it's contraindication for vulnerability. We may not move to stage two or have them start taking these deep emotional risks, but we can still use the process and include that as part of the process. Again, mm -hmm. EFT is such very very confrontive, just in a very empathic kind of way. So we're going to put okay. And so at what point? you know, do you turn to that other partner that uh, that's outside the re relationship right here in the present, you know, or when the line comes, whatever it is, you know, we're right. still. And, and sometimes it's about saying, I'm not able to let go of that person. And mm -hmm. what we want to do is facilitate a process that allows each person to speak from their best kind of view of self, right? What's going to work for them. They're trying to discover if they even have the opportunity to repair with someone. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means that we're getting down to the core of it and somebody's saying, I'm not able to cut off contact. And then mm -hmm. we need to help them tell their partner that because then they can make a more clear decision about whether mm -hmm. or not they want to invest in moving into stage two work. Right. Mm -hmm. So we definitely try to get to you know, and sometimes not, and I love that you're saying empathically, sometimes not. I mean, the cases that I have, it doesn't sound very empathic when I'm, you know, we it's, I've never heard someone who has been engaged in an affair say that, you know, I have a right to privacy and not still being deceptive. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So when deception's on the table, it's very hard to get someone to commit to a process. And we want them to be committed to a process of discovering what's best for them individually mm-hmm. and best for the relationship in stage one. And some of that is investigative work. Some mm-hmm. of that is vulnerability and impact and really exploring how the relationship was emotionally in the beginning and what's happening now as a result of this betrayal and what each partner is willing to do. Right. And that's, that's discovering with each person, what I need to feel like there's a willingness to try. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in the beginning, I used to think like, okay, EFT is going to save everybody. But to me, it's now I'm committed to helping them make the best decision based on Mm -hmm. what we have on the table and what we're experiencing in the room. And I'm not afraid to make direct observations Mm -hmm. about someone's available or not. And if they're not, I just help them say that, you know, it's not ambiguous anymore. I love how you say though, that you're making observations and you're helping, you know, to make that clear and help them kind of own and say that notice there's a difference because I've had a lot of couples come to me after seeing other therapists and the other therapist is actually giving them their opinion. You should divorce this person. You should break up, you know, and you know, a, not only is that not ethical, but it's also clearly not attuned to what they want. And so, you know, this brings up a really key point that I want to highlight in the process, first and foremost, that comes up around betrayals and working with betrayals, even if if there's still a part of it still coming on is self of the therapist issues, because Mm -hmm. so much of that really can affect the therapist and their protective parts may come on and they want to, I see it a lot. I do a lot of supervision around this. So, remembering that we hold the space for both partners. Yes, it may feel easier to empathize with the partner who has been hurt or on on the betrayed side, the injured partner. But we really also have to remember that there is also something going on for the partner who does the stepping out. That mm-hmm. they, even if it's ineffective, it's hurtful. And again, we're never validating their behavior. We are just searching for the pain, the emotion, the legitimate attachment needs underneath that's driving, you know, these behaviors. And so we have to find a path towards empathy with that so we can hold space for both partners. Right. Um, and the other part you said is, again, you know, it's not up to us to decide the outcome. And I've been really surprised. I've had couples come in that I totally thought could work through the process after an affair um, and stick it out. And they didn't. And then I had other couples that, you know, it was so significant. And it, I mean, way more fractured than I've seen other couples. And yet they stuck it out. So, you know, again, it's it's not about us or what we think. You know, ultimately, you know, even if they decide not to stay together. And again, I also have that other video on helping couples who want to break up using EFT is Mm -hmm. we can use the cycle to organize the process that got them here, the injuries, you know, again, help them end it with dignity and health rather than, you know, being at each other's throat, especially if there is children involved or, you know, they still have to maintain some form of a relationship for the betterment of a, family unit that might be involved. Right. So, you know, well, I think that's where it can become. Well, I mean, let me just address this one piece in terms of like, determine, or, you know, saying my opinion about whether or not a couple should stay together. I mean, I think there's been two couples in my 25 year career, where I spoke to one of the partners and said one time in the room, and then another time in private, like, this is not a safe situation. The, the abuse here is explicit and I need to protect you and I need to help you develop safety options, resources for yourself right now to be able to see that this is happening because it's impacting you and it doesn't seem like you can see it, right? So that's not you must divorce this person, but mm-hmm. it's like when abuse is in the room, you have to be able to call it. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean that the person is an abuser. It means that they are. there's a part of the process that can get abusive and it needs to be labeled as such yeah. based on. And we also take that with great care and have a training on that. Cause a lot of times therapists also 
become eager and even just society in general, anyone who right. does something hurtful, you know, right. that was intentional is you're being abusive, you're an abuser, and we're so right. quick to label and judge and pathologize, right. you know, and and you just have to see that as like part of a process of place where they go when they're most desperate and see behind the behavior mm -hmm. like you were speaking to earlier. And sometimes that's helpful and sometimes it's not. Um, and that's for each partner to decide, are they, what are they willing to work towards mm -hmm. and what are they willing to unpack in order to get down to the underlying attachment effect that is driving those reactive behaviors? Mm -hmm. And can they acknowledge that it's been unsafe or that they've contributed in a way to a climate that has led to betrayals, right? And so acknowledgement is really important. What, what it's labeled as, not as important, but it needs to be acknowledged if there's repetitive cycled patterns of emotional harm, right, mm -hmm. to the other partner. And if you don't have acknowledgement, which is part of the safety and stabilization in the beginning, working with relationship betrayals, you can't really move, right? And that's okay. You just help the person say, I'm not moving. I don't think what I've done has been a betrayal. I don't think that I will ever be willing to open my heart up to you again. Getting clear about that and putting it on the table helps people make better decisions, mm -hmm. right? But you need a map for that because if you have a, two people coming in bleeding out, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to identify how to stabilize that situation. And it's not just like the grandiose EFT, like let's talk about cycle work. Like you, there are real specific things that we can do to move in that process to help somebody feel centered. Now, like you said, if there are personal kind of self of therapist issues showing up in that process, that can really move and shift the clinical experience for the partners, right? And there's especially in these highly escalated cases, if you're not centered mm -hmm. and you're not, you don't have a map for what to do and how to handle certain situations, mm -hmm. it's really easy to fall into our own survival skills, especially right. if it happens to be something we're familiar with. Right. How to hold the one who has done the injuring with empathy and, and understand what's happening for them that it's not just as simple as oh they're doing these behaviors like not getting stuck in judgment and pathology right. but right. holding space for there's also something going on for them you know and it's getting right. expressed in this way can we make it explicit and you also said something that's really important that i i also want to make sure that i that we kind of highlight so you mentioned like you know, having people be explicit about, I don't think I can ever move past this, or I don't think what I've done is an injury. I mean, what also sticks in my mind that I can, you know, from experience and, and the process is sometimes also at the beginning, they're speaking about that from a place of pain. It, it I think it's sort of like, we got to differentiate between, you know, even if we could repair this and things went back to different you know, is that something I actually want? Or am I just like really at the point of no return? And, you know, I don't know how to say that, how to have the bravery to put that out there. It feels scary, even though that is what I really want, you know, versus like, we're, we're both in our blocks and our defenses. And I'm so rooted in the pain that of course, I don't have hope that this could be different, you know, but if it could be different, I would want to stay or the injuring partner, again, feeling shame or again, like, hey, my pain is unseen. So of course, mm -hmm. this was not a problem. It was a solution to a problem. And I need someone to see my pain. So of course, I'm going to dig in and say, no, this right. wasn't a problem, you know, sort of holding that. Well, I think that I think the the rigid defensive stance where people come in disengaged, but like maybe highly escalated, but unwilling to put their heart on the table. It's more rooted in fear, I mm -hmm. think, right? For both partners, whoever's done the injuring versus the injured party, right? It, if you have been harmed because your partner's been deceptive and you're not sure if you can trust what they're saying, mm -hmm. and even if they want to repair and they want to make it work with you, it's very hard to believe their words when you don't all of your, your entire, a bomb is blown off in terms of any trust that was from the beginning developed in a relationship, you end up losing all that. And it's like a rebuilding time. Mm -hmm. The person who's rebuilding, who's done the injuring has to be willing to acknowledge that everything's been wiped out in the case of like a, a long-term affair, let's say, mm -hmm. right. Or, you know, maybe it could be two weeks. It just, affairs are all in general depends on the 
the couple, right? How they impact some are injuries, some are not right. Mm -hmm. Some are fair, some are not. So it, you have to really be willing to lean into that world. And there's, if you have your own belief and judgment around bringing another partner into your relationship, right. And you may think that's an affair move or deceptive move. They may have decided that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to really be clear on we're walking into their world mm -hmm. and we have to understand and adhere to what their courtyard looks like in terms of what's safe and what's not what was a betrayal, what was not. And you often see them disagreeing on that, right? And so they're rooted in kind of the fear of talking about mm -hmm. what's happened because when they've tried, one, the person who's injured, they've tried typically and their partner's defensive or blaming or minimizing in some way. So they stopped doing it. Now their pain is really way down there. And the fear of even opening that up again, things could go sideways. They could lose each other, right? So they end up not doing that. So just getting them to commit to the process of discovering a safe way of talking about whatever has happened mm -hmm. is really on the, it's obligation of the clinician, right? right? So it needs to be a predictable process that's heading towards stability, stability, meaning in the process, not between the couple, very acknowledging that everybody's afraid. Both mm -hmm. parties have such level of, of fear and often pain, as you said. So just being willing to have a process laid out that's forecasted mm -hmm. so people know what they're committing to, right? It doesn't mean you have to be back together with that person. It means right. that we're going to help you make the best decision. Right. And I often, you know, when couples come in and they, you know, again, they're a little ambivalent, I may say, you know, well, we're going to just take it week by mm -hmm. week, you know, and, and I hope that you keep me informed. And if at any point you feel like, you know what, I am truly done, I'm past that point in no return then, you know, we'll have a talk all together and we'll talk about what to do with that and where to go with that, you know, holding space for those, you know, it could feel like a curveball, but again, human behavior is actually very predictable when we understand those patterns, mm -hmm. you know, and so I love, I love what you're saying right there. And, um, you know, can you, you, so you use this word courtyard. Could you explain that a little bit more? I really like that. <laughs> It's funny. We have, um, we used to, we actually created a, an intervention called courtyarding, um, mm -hmm. because Jim used to make fun of me. Like I would be setting up, here's what it's going to look like. Here's what we're going to talk about. Here's how we're going to move when we get there. And this is what it may look like. And here's what the expectations are. And he's like, it's like, you're building bricks. You're like setting up a courtyard for the couple to come into the space that allows them to talk through the things that they're not able to talk about, but you're committed to kind of getting them on the scene in a courtyard and make it safe. You want that to be transferable out to the real world, right? Like, what does this look like? How do we make a courtyard around our relationship process when we're distressed, injured, need each other, need to get close? We can all go off and do our own things, but what does it look like when we're talking about things that are painful or we've let each other down or maybe a trigger's happened or maybe we have done another thing that's a, a relationship betrayal to one partner, but not to the other. How do we go into that and talk about it so that it's not left undone and setting up kind of the expectations for that process and therapy that we can transfer, you know, 10 years later, like, Hey, we had another injury here. We need to sit down and here's what it looks like. Right. We want them to leave with a process that can handle and manage and resource them in moments of distress. We just interviewed, um, at the last training, we interviewed uh, a couple that I had seen about seven or eight years ago, and he's a SWAT officer. And he was talking about, you know, we were just interviewing them in front of the group. Like, what was, what kept you in the process? You know, he was the one that had betrayed her. Uh, it was a heterosexual couple. Um, and, and he was talking about like, you know, the thing was, I knew that what I was doing was shitty. And, but I knew when I came into the office that there was going to be a process I could participate in. And I knew that Lisa was going to have my back, even though I was the one that had done the shitty thing. She knew I needed help, how I could move with my wife because mm -hmm. I was so done apologizing, but she felt like she was really understanding and helping me see that I didn't know how to do this process. And that I wasn't me, the bad person that couldn't do it. It's like, there was something I didn't know how to do. And so she would, he said, you know, she used the word courtyard a lot. This is like where we come to work and here's what it looks like. And he's like, I still set that up now with mm -hmm. my wife. 
when we have something happen that's scary or I'm hurt, we still set it up now. So we just have kind of kept the word around mm -hmm. and it's really, you know, like I symbolic of a place we come together to have these meaningful conversations and try to work mm -hmm. on things. Right. When things are really going sideways. Right. And, and here's a corrective process that we can mm -hmm. rely on that may or may not help us get through it, but at least we can come back to it if we need to take a break or we know kind of what that looks like. And this isn't like I statements and things like that. It's more about like, what is the platform we want couples to come back to? You don't get to stay there. Right. Mm -hmm. So Johnson used to say like intimacy and connection is an island. You get to visit. You have to learn how to get back when you're off the island because mm -hmm. you'll be off the island quite a bit. But the goal is to learn how to get back there. Like when we need each other, how do we get back? Which is about like feeling our feelings, asking for what we need and having your partner respond right mm -hmm. in a way that feels accessible, even if they don't know how to respond if they can say, I don't know how to respond, but I'm here and I see this is big, that's still responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love what you said. What really stuck out to me also was this idea of even the partner who had done the injuring knew that you as the therapist had his back. And, and to me, that's so important, again, coming back to this idea of therapists, making sure that we don't get stuck on judgment and pathology, you know, that we're able to have that stance, that EFT stance of relentless empathy and curiosity, even with the partners that do the stepping out, because if we come in judging them and, you know, pathologizing them, they're going to shut down and we're not going to be able to get underneath their defenses to access mm -hmm. what's really driving it and help the change that needs to happen. Have it, even if they're stuck in defenses at first and saying, you know, I don't think what I did was wrong. You know, again, we know there's a lot it's, as EFT therapists and knowing attachment, we know there's way more to the story. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to get stuck on what we see on the surface. Right. We recognize, we give it its place. We understand it in context and we know there's more and that there is a hurting human being. And, and still part of the process is there was something in the relationship system where they had a need and didn't know how to turn towards their partner <clears throat> and talk about right. it, get it met, you know? Right. So we, I love that mm -hmm. non-pathological stance that we have, you know, being able to hold that space so that we can approach both, make it very explicit. And I love setting up that courtyarding, you know, is like, and that I think is an important part of the process, especially at the beginning, the therapist may feel that urgency of like, whoa, the same time we Rome wasn't built in a day, we can't fix it all right now, but they're coming in, they're so escalated, the affair just got disclosed, there's so much pain. And yet, how do we send them home, you know, at the end of session? And how do they even get through their week or do business together? When there's so much pain on the table, it's so alive and active. It's a, it's a lot of hard work and these couples need to be scheduled, not necessarily back to back, right? It's a lot of brain fuel that you burn in these processes as the clinician, but it's exciting to see people get to places, you know, it's get to places they haven't before. Um, you know, and it's hard when there's been a first discovery, mm -hmm. right? To, to find that empathic response to the person that has, let's say, done the betraying, right? Because when you try to validate and find your way to the pain that maybe drove the stepping mm -hmm. out, the other partner's not loving that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's tricky to balance those alliances in the moment and to really make the space to get curious about it. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that the other partner who's been injured can hang on to. They have to really know that you also see the mm -hmm. impact of what's happened of the deception, right? Yeah. And that you're not going to allow for further deception, right? Because we know how that impacts the process. Yeah. Forward. So laying it all out there, it's like a consent, right? A consent to commit to the process, not to the outcome. And I think as a clinician, you just have to be committed to the process. And that's mm -hmm. what we're doing, right? We're not, I'm not, I don't, I literally tell them the decision you make is yours. I don't care if you stay together or not. Mm -hmm. I need to get to the most thorough, deepest part of the process so we can understand and with clarity, make the best decision Yeah, yourselves, right? Yeah. And so they know that you're not going to force them into staying or force them into apologizing. It's about really opening up the space to talk about mm -hmm. it. And that needs to be courtyarded and that needs yeah. to be predictable. So or jump in and say, get a divorce. You know, I think you should get a right. divorce. This was too terrible. You know, it's, I love, it, it really 
brings up the idea of modeling that secure attachment and creating secure attachment in the therapy room, you know, with us as the therapist is that, you know, we got to, we got to hold that safety, that relentless empathy so that even the person who did the hurting, the betraying can look at themselves without getting hijacked into the shame, into the, I'm so terrible. You know, like I can see the terrible thing I've done. I can hold the impact without Mm -hmm. getting sucked into, I'm a terrible person, you know, because remember, I love Scott Woolley's reframe. Bad people don't feel bad for hurting others. (laughs) You know, the fact Mm -hmm. that we feel bad that we want to move away from that, you know, again, connected to that signal of, I know I hurt somebody and that feels awful. It's the fact that we're actually really good people on the inside, you know? So even if we're defended or struggle looking into that mirror at the beginning, right? Cause we're seeing something that we did that we feel like reflects the most horrible part of ourselves or, or, you know, part of ourselves that we're, we're not comfortable looking at cause it, it might've acted out in a way that was hurtful, you know, and, and that's hard to look at that and know that somebody's not going to make you feel like a monster or a terrible human being as you take a look at that most honest part of yourself that does need to do some work or to repair. Yeah. I mean, I think part of, you know, just as a side note, part of my growth in EFT, especially working with relationship betrayals was the seven years I spent working with probation and domestic violence offenders and mostly men. Um, you know, the groups that I was working in were males, 52 week mandated groups that they had to attend for doing something as determined by the courts, you know, in the DV area. And over time, sitting with those guys back to back to back, right? There's shame, there's hurt, there's pain, there's previous attachment injuries in their own history, family of origin trauma. There's all sorts of things you can get to know. Um, and it's really easy to be reactive to these these guys, right? They're typically using some sort of substance. They're also, you know, it's not like their first time offense, right? So it's really easy to get judgmental and to not take a look behind the broken mirror, as they say right. To use David Wexler's term. Um, but for them to be able to, to sit, to sit with them over weeks on weeks and help them to, you know, what's the difference between someone who gets self-reflective and is willing to acknowledge and to look at the impact and someone who's not, you learn that over time. Right. And it's an exploration, exploration, shoulder to shoulder. And the timing of that, sometimes it needs to be done individually in couples work. Right. But it's so important that we find that space you're talking about and have empathy for these bad behaviors and help people externalize the behavior from who they are as a person, right? And be able to see it as an externalization. That takes time in the beginning with newly fresh injured people, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're so hurt. All they know is their partner just stabbed them and they're bleeding out and they're still holding the weapon at times. And you have to get the weapon to stop the stabbing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really important. So you have to get that investment and it may need some individual sessions. It may need um, for some validation that's triggering to the other partner. And that's okay. You just say, I can imagine this pisses you off when I'm seeing this behavior within this kind of lens. And I don't want to dismiss or minimize the impact that this behavior has had on you, but we have to understand where that came from. We have to explore that together. And if it's too hard to do together in the room, we can do it separately, right? Until you're ready, right? So there's just lots of different ways that I've learned to to kind of find, you know, as you said, the pain behind Mm -hmm. the behavior. Um, It's imperative and it's necessary. But how you do that, like conceptually, it makes sense. But how EFT, we've been trained to do that is like go for the vulnerability. Sometimes that's not where we go. Sometimes Mm -hmm. there's five steps before that you know, in, in terms of the alliance, there's building an alliance is seeing someone's experience through their eyes and yeah. being able to feel your way into it and also make sense of it and have good organization around what you're going to do with it. Right. I'd say, you know, there's even sort of layers of vulnerability that getting honesty and truth on the table still presents a layer of vulnerability. Again, we may not be yeah. having each other turn towards each other in this the deepest layers of vulnerability, you know, to me, the the metaphor that always comes up to me on those deep layers is like a trapeze bar, you know, flying trapeze, and you're asking them to take this leap and trust that their partner is going to catch them or that there's a net at the bottom to keep them right. from going splat, you know, so we may not be asking them to take a leap off the trapeze. Right. 
but they are, you know, emotionally, they're still revealing parts and being mm-hmm. open and honest, which is still a shade of vulnerability. Right, right. And they take the risks with the clinician first. Sometimes that's in an individual session. Sometimes it's within the couple process, but they're taking the risk with you first. And we provide that net initially. Yeah. And how we're collaboratively developing a process they can count on, right? That's the net. And sometimes it goes sideways and there's still a net. Yeah. <laughs> right? I can imagine yeah. how hard that would be. You know, if you're the one who did the injuring or the the hurting to you know, think about going to therapy and like, okay, but if I talk about this, am I going to get a fair shake? Is the therapist just going to say like how terrible I am because I cheated? And it's like, I'm never really going to be seen as a good person or that there's anything underneath. So I could see why there would be even a lot of blocks or hesitancy for that client to feel like, oh, can I go to therapy and Mm -hmm. have safety there myself as somebody who did the hurting? Right. Right. And I think therapists, even though I mean, I think there's, they're all well-intentioned, right? And if you're doing any sort of EFT training, you're going to be in the kind of specialty arena of couples work. You're going to be dealing with relationship betrayals, right? And even sometimes they're well-intentioned can say things that feel like a judgment to the clients that have done the injuring, right? So if we can keep it in like a process consultant and we understand there's a predictable process, and people understand why we're asking questions, the more they know ahead of time, the better they're going to participate in the process, the more safe they'll feel with you. Yeah. Right. So it's just so, that sometimes I think it's gone. It's, you know, EFT people will go prematurely to the injury mm-hmm. right, and prematurely to running an enactment because they're to heal it. supposed to do that and heal yeah. it. Right. And that's not what was meant of kind of tracking that process in the attachment injury model. It's, it's meant to be something in the stage two kind of healing the depth Mm -hmm. of the repair. And then what does that look like in the beginning, right? In stage one, that's where I think we've gotten way more clear on the process. And we, we've tracked couples and kind of what's happened across stage one Mm -hmm. to be able to lay out very clearly, just using the regular steps of the model Mm -hmm. and paying attention and being attuned to what they're bringing in, right? Is you're just adding that piece in the part where there's predictability and stabilization. Yeah. So when the couple first comes in, I mean, in a way you are kind of going, you know, if they're coming in for an attachment injury, you're going to it, but again, not in the same way that you would in stage two, where stage two, we're intentionally going into the wound on the deepest levels to heal it. This it's more like putting it in context of the cycle, you know, and again, I sort of almost treat it like a piece of content to work the cycle around and follow the process of what happens, you know, what are the emotions and the moves and the meanings, you know, what happens now in the present when you guys try to talk about this between the two of you. Right. And there's pre and post, like we said, right. There's, there's a cycle that was in place already. There's a pattern in which they manage disconnection and, distress. And we have to look at that, but we're not necessarily heading to that right up front. We're dealing with this original, I mean, the, the immediate action item, right. Mm -hmm. The bleed out that's in the room. And then we're expanding our understanding of how they got there, like developing that cohesive narrative of how this process lended itself to kind of a betrayal of this nature. And can we acknowledge that? And then where do we need to work to kind of prevent that from happening in the future? Right, which is so I love what you're saying. And um, so it's like you're saying, we go to the present process cycle. And then diagnostically, you know, through the course, we're, we're uncovering the past cycle, whether it's the same or similar, and this is just an iteration, or, or if it's changed somehow, and sort of, you know, weaving those two together, mm-hmm. and working towards a new process, a new better cycle, you know, and keeping that frame. And this is often what I tell my couples when I come in, if if they are committed to the process and they're both like, we're on the same page of, yes, we want to heal this. We want to feel better. And we want to make sure this never happens again. Then I say, great. That's what we're going to work on is by the end of our work, you know, end of therapy is knowing why this happened and why it will never happen again, you know, yeah. but we don't go right to that at the very beginning. And because right. you know, a lot of that, we, you know, there's a lot of weeds in the way, you know, right. that we have to 
work through first mm -hmm. before we can even get to that information. Well, the thing we know across any model with repair, right, is that the person who's been on the injuring end of it, right, the person who's had the impact needs to fully believe for couples to report that they've had resolution or repair after a major betrayal. The thing across any model that is for sure in the research is that the person who's been injured believes wholeheartedly that their partner can feel their feelings, feel has felt the impact of what they did, meaning there's like mirror kind of experiences happening. Like they're feeling their way into what it was like to have that betrayal happen to them. They really believe their partner can feel the feelings and mm -hmm. they believe their partner fully understands why that happened in their relationship. That's mm -hmm. in a nutshell kind of summarized. Those two things have to happen for couples to repair from major betrayals. That is what they would say the victim, the person who's been injured from a relationship betrayal will say when they've had successful treatment, regardless of the model you're working from. So I think that we have from an EFT lens, a really good opportunity at meeting both of those, both mm -hmm. of those criteria for repair. And we have a great outline of how to do that in the regular steps and stages of EFT, but mm -hmm. it's just how to put that and kind of superimpose the injury on top of the regular steps. You don't have to do an additional, additional mm -hmm. sidestep of attachment injury repair. It's like you're doing the regular EFT steps, but how do you move with highly escalated big relationship betrayals within the steps of the model? Yeah. And I think that's where we've gotten really clear about that and we can meet those two criteria, right? Mm -hmm. so that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So before we wrap up, I was curious, do you have, you know, when you do have couples coming in for an attachment injury, is there anything that you say to them um, that might help the people watching as a way to like kind of paint the road ahead and make it explicit? So one of the things I say, I think is what I've said throughout this talk is that we want to make the process predictable. We want it to be something you can rely on. We understand that you might be coming in unsure of whether or not you want to repair with this person, but we're here to deal with kind of what you're bringing to the table and to be a consultant and alongside of you as you really get clear about what's happened, what's happened from a fact perspective what can be acknowledged, where the blocks are in the process, because it's not the the thing itself that happened, the affair or the moment where you weren't there for your partner. It's how you handle it together. So we need to understand both what that was like before this happened with the two of you. What's it like now? And how do you want it to be? Right. And people can't often tell you how they want it to be. Uh, they'll say something like, I just want this to be over. I want this to be in the rearview mirror. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, we have a process for that. We have steps that we can help you get it there, but here's what it has to look like beforehand. Here's right. the courtyard that we need. Here's the consent that we need. Here's the willingness that we need, the commitment, right? So we talk about that. And then we, at, I say at the end of the time when we spend, you know, I can commit to you, but you know, by the time we have 10 to 12 hours together, you'll have a more clear idea of whether or not you want to put your heart back on the table, either mm -hmm. one of you. And we can help you make that decision together as a team, um, but we're not going to make decisions for you about if you need to stay or if you're riding a dead horse, right? We're right. not going to, we're not going to make that decision for you because we, we don't know enough about the two of you. We right. can help you shift that process and talk about it either way, whether you decide to stay together or not, we'll help you through to the end. Yeah. And I love how you distinguish, you know, 10 to 12 hours. Again, that was like the old EFT research. You didn't say we'll have it all nice and tidy oh, yeah, and fixed yeah. in 10 to 12 hours. You said 10 to 12 hours, you'll have a better idea. Mm -hmm. You know, if we want to continue to work the process ahead or if we need to maybe pivot and do something a little bit different. Right. And, you know, and I love, you know, also what you're saying is, you know, we make that process explicit and in a way, they're sort of like rhetorical questions. You're not actually saying, answer those right now. Like, you right. know, how do you want it to be? Even though sometimes they will try to answer that in the now, even though we're not, we're not actually saying, let's figure it out right now. Cause often they right. don't know in a deeper way. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I know you have some trainings coming up and you're going to be doing some more trainings in the future. And 
as always, you know, the EFT community may want to invite you to their home base and uh, have you do a training. So where can folks find you? What do you have going on that they can come and see you? Well, I think the biggest things I have going on right now is I'm doing a lot of the family therapy trainings around the country. Um, most of those family therapy trainings have to deal with relationship betrayal, betrayals and kind of looking at the big system. And then Jim and I do broken, unbroken bonds um, periodically throughout um, the United States. And you can find most of that information. It'd be easiest just to email me at my Gmail address, um, but you can find some of the training events on RaynovaSanDiego.com. And as we open those up for registration, they will be posted on that website. And what's your email address? Lisa Palmer Olson, O-L-S-E-N at gmail.com. All right. So Olson is spelled with one O and one E, not two O's. Yes. <laughs> so Lisa Palmer Olson at gmail.com. Uh-huh. Now, how do you spell Raynova? R-E-N-O-V-A and then San Diego.com. All right, perfect. So I'll make sure that in the at least YouTube version of this, in the description for the video, I'll put a link to both your email and to your web addresses. And then if you're watching this on pod, listening to this on podcast, you may have to rewind it and, and take notes on that or just Google Lisa Palmer Olson EFT Los, uh, San Diego. <laughs> and you'll be able to probably pull her name up if you didn't get to rewind that and catch those. So, um, and yeah, so we're just so grateful to have you and I'm excited to um, see you in live action and the uh, Unbroken Bonds training. And I know it's amazing. Thank you. It's great being here. Yeah. So thank you everyone for watching, for sending me ideas about what you want to hear. Keep it coming. And thank you all. Just make sure that you hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients for Helping Professionals, available on Amazon or on my website, www.drbugatti.com.